Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm just gonna have my video on here and then um, turn it off so that we can kind of focus on the presentation, but I just wanted to say a quick hello um, and then I'll get into the presentation. So today we are, like Zara said, we're gonna go over kind of a brief overview about um, our umbrella organization, Fila Day Conservation Fund, and spend the majority of our time talking about the Bay Area Puma Project. Um, and then we'll take some questions at the end and talk about how we can, um, how you all can get involved. Um, so to start with, Fila Day Conservation Fund, this is our umbrella organization. Um, this organization was founded in 2006 by Zara, who is an entrepreneur and biologist. Um, the mission of the organization is really to um, strengthen native wildcat populations and doing that from a, a three-pronged approach using research, education, and community stewardship together um, to really conserve these animals. Um, here is our team. So Kat Gayo is our office manager. Ginger is our um, ED. Um, and then there's a picture of me. I'm the co-PI and my daughter, Bibi, who is the uh, chief distractor for our organization. Um, she's the cutest, best baby of all time. And then um, David Stoner is my co-PI. He works out at Utah State University. Um, so Fila Day Organization, Fila Day Conservation Fund has worked in 19 different countries on a variety of different uh, wildcat species. We currently have over 100 remote global volunteers. Um, you can see from the list the, the, the wide variety of species that we've worked with. Um, and we're actually going to get a chance through these webinar series to um, learn a bit more about some of those projects. Specifically next week we have Sherry talking about the Sava Uchida project. Um, and then we'll also have one about our Chilean Puma project coming up. So if that's something that interests you, definitely um, register for those seminars as well. Okay, so why do we focus on wildcats? And there's really two main reasons. And one is they have an outsized role in the ecosystems where, um, where they live and also a whole lot of charisma packed into these animals. So a little bit more here. Um, there's kind of a subtle difference between a, a keystone species and an indicator species. Um, keystone species are ones that really hold an ecosystem together. They, in their absence, um, a whole ecosystem can crumble apart. So they're absolutely vital. An indicator species on the other hand is one that's kind of these canary in the coal mine species. Um, they're very sensitive to disturbances um, and their loss or addition to an ecosystem really can give you an indication of quality of that environment. Um, apex predators of which wild cats are frequently one, um, apex predators really fall in between being both of these species. So because of their large habitat requirements, um, they're very important indicator species, um, but they also have a, some really important top-down ecological effects on the communities, which makes them keystone species. So um, on top of that, I mean, these, just look at these animals. They're beautiful, they're um, charismatic, they're majestic, they're strong, they're adorable. Um, so they really are a whole package here. Okay, so that's just a really brief overview of Fila Day Conservation Fund. Um, now I'm going to spend most of this talk um, discussing Fila Day's flagship research project, which is the Bay Area Puma Project. So the project itself was founded about a year after um, Fila Day was founded, and with the goal of really conserving pumas and bobcats in their wild habitats in the San Francisco Bay Area. So originally we were working with um, colleagues at uh, University or UC Santa Cruz. Um, we eventually split off into two separate projects. UC Santa Cruz Puma project is still going strong. They're doing a lot of coloring and really important research down there. 
Um, we have since worked in all of the other San Francisco Bay Area counties. Um, each one of these little points is where we have data collection going on in the last um, three years or so, so since January 2017. Um, the yellow dots indicate where we've detected pumas, black dots is where we have not detected pumas. So we've worked throughout the Bay Area. Um, initially, we were doing a lot of um, collaring of these animals. Collaring provides um, a really great data set, very fine scale where you can figure out exactly where they're moving, um, where they're making kills, um, where they're denning and so forth. So really important data sets coming out of these collaring projects. Um, but with that said, we've in the last few years shifted to more non-invasive techniques. And the primary way that we're collecting data right now is with wildlife cameras. So we have somewhere between 100 and 150 of these cameras out um, in the Bay Area at any given time, um, collecting data on both wildcats and also other wildlife species and human use types. Um, so they're in a variety of habitats um, so that we can really get a clear picture of where activity is occurring. And then we have some, a new um, project that we're trying to get going, which is hair snares. So this is taking advantage of um, behaviors that pumas do naturally, which is this rubbing behavior to um, spread some pheromones. Um, and using that behavior to our advantage to collect hair. And hair provides, a, it's a very rich data source in that you can get information about um, genetic diversity, about diet preferences, about stress levels, about um, sex ratios and um, other population characteristics. So it's a, it's a really great um, data set to have. So we're working right now on the best way to and con most consistent way of being able to collect that. So we have a few different prototypes out in the field and we're working with um, Oakland Zoo to test some different um, scents to try to get them to rub consistently. And I have some cool videos to share of um, pumas doing this behavior and um, rubbing. So this is... Um, this rock has been sprayed with a pheromone. The screaming sound is an audio lure meant to sound like, um, like a, a deer in distress. So that's what you're hearing in the background there. Um, so you can see this puma is really interested in the smell and, and rubbing himself all over it. And then I have one more video to show you. Um, this is a, a big boy in the East Bay. Um, back behind him, we have one of our hair snares. He's, he's come to check it out, but um, you can see he eventually decides that he's not going to do that, probably because I don't think he would fit in there. He's, he's a very big boy. Um, yeah, so we're trying to work on, on that project right now as well. Um, all of our work, um, we rely pretty heavily on volunteers, interns, and citizen scientists. And we've had over 400 volunteers since um, the Bay Area Puma Project was founded. And volunteers help us with all sorts of things from data collection and data analysis to bookkeeping to um, pamphlet design, all sorts of things. So. Um, we're really thankful for all of them. Okay, so moving on to why we focus specifically on pumas in the Bay Area. Um, some of this overlaps with why we work on wildcats generally. So there's a lot of really important benefits to the ecosystems where they live. Um, pumas in particular have some really special benefits to humans um, in the Bay Area and the rest of the Americas. Um, so we're going to go over that to start with. So first of all, pumas have these important top-down ecological effects. And what do I mean by that? Um, you may be aware of these types of effects if you follow, um, the, have been following the wolf reintroduction in Yellowstone. 
um, and the amazing biodiversity effects they've been having there. Pumas have that same effect here um, on the West Coast. So when they're present, we see much higher biodiversity. And that's because when they're absent, we see an overpopulation of ungulates. So in our case, that's um, mule deer, but in other parts of the country, that would be elk or white-tailed deer. Anyway, when these ungulates become overpopulated, they just absolutely decimate vegetation. And without that vegetation, um, there's nowhere for frogs and birds to have their nests and lay their eggs. The, um, you don't have the wildflowers needed for the biodiversity of insects and butterflies and so forth. Um, so that's what I mean by having these um, top-down ecological effects. Pumas are also what we call ecosystem engineers. They really change the composition of um, the ecosystems where they live. Um, and one of the ways they do this, there's been some research that shows that puma prey carcasses are incredibly important. Um, in one aspect, they in, have been shown to increase the soil microbe and invertebrate biodiversity. So lots of um, extra biodiversity in the soil itself, which in turn um, allows for increased plant biodiversity. Um, and having a lot more of these um, bugs, worms, other invertebrate species means there's more food and more diverse food sources for insectivores like opossums and um, a range of small bird species, songbird species, excuse me. Um, prey carcasses also have really direct um, benefits to scavengers like vultures um, that will eat leftovers um, and even small scavengers like uh, rodents will sometimes gnaw on the bones afterwards to um, reach their calcium requirements. And we actually have this really interesting video. This is a puma prey carcass that we found, put up a camera on, and you can see there's both a bobcat and a coyote scavenging at the same time off of this carcass, which is just absolutely amazing. Um, He's trying to get a piece of that leg off there. Okay, so in addition to um, the benefits to the ecosystem on the whole, they also keep the their prey populations healthier. Um, so I'm talking specifically about um, this study that was done about a decade ago now. Gosh, it seems more recent than that, but. Um, Anyway, mountain lions can and do prefer to prey on sick individuals. So for those of you following the chronic wasting disease um, outbreak in the Midwest right now, it's really decimating a lot of the elk population. Pumas actually will preferentially prey on infected animals, even if they aren't showing visible symptoms. Um, Pumas can still tell that they're infected. And why is this so important? It means that those infected individuals aren't part of the population and aren't spreading that disease. So you actually see a decrease in prevalence of infectious diseases in the prey populations if um, an apex predator like puma is present. So it's been documented in chronic wasting disease, but um, it's likely to occur in for other diseases as well, which um, is related to my next point, um, which is that they also remove zoonotic diseases. So you might be hearing this as a buzzword, especially lately with the coronavirus outbreak. Um, zoonotic diseases are ones that spill over from animals into people. Um, and there's some early research being done that shows that one of the reasons that the West Coast has lesser prevalence of Lyme disease um, is because we still have apex predators here, specifically pumas, um, as compared to the East Coast. And that's through some really complicated mechanisms, but basically it's because we have fewer deer and increased biodiversity, which kind of dilutes um, the tick population, which is what carries Lyme disease. Um, in addition to that benefit to humans, there's also um, been some modeling that shows that 
if pumas were um, reintroduced to some of these Midwestern and Eastern states, they would expect to see a decrease in automobile accidents with deer. And it actually would save dozens of lives, um, hundreds of lives, you know, over a decade or so if there were, was actually an apex predator in those locations. Um, so, of course, I mean, why do we care about Puma specifically? Surely there are a other apex predators that provide these same sorts of services, right? Well, not anymore. So California used to have other apex predators, grizzly bear and wolves. Of course, we have this tiny pop, this tiny um, pack in Lassen, but um, suffice to say, we don't really have a ton, we don't have any other apex predator species. So we really have to protect pumas if we want to keep these beneficial ecosystem services. And we should really be worried about losing pumas locally. Um, so their range is about half what it is, has been historically. Um, and that's because in the early 1900s, they were persecuted and um, hunted and as well as their prey being overhunted. So there was just a huge population collapse um, and those, most of that has not been recolonized. Um, and then additionally in the San Francisco Bay area and in other parts of California as well, we are seeing additional declines for a, a wide variety of reasons. So one of those um, is through depredation permits. So in California, it is not legal to hunt um, pumas. However, if you suspect that a puma has taken your domestic animal, you can um, apply for a California Department of Fish and Wildlife depredation permit and have that animal removed. Um, and over the last decade, there's been dozens to hundreds of these permits issued and um, animals taken as a result of those permits. And then of course, there's gonna be poaching on top of that. So we know that this happens even here in the Bay Area. Um, this, what they call the three S's, shoot, shovel, and shut up. So some untold number of animals are lost every year in California through poaching. And then of course there's indirect human causes and there's a few different ways that this happens. Um, automobile accidents, there's somewhere between 50 and 100 of these in California each year killing pumas. Um, also the bioaccumulation of poison like rodent poisons. So the, the way that this happens is that um, a human has a rodent problem. They put out some rodent poisons which are fed on by rodents, um, which take them out into their backyard or whatever after, and they, that's where they die. But um, perhaps before they die or just after, they're scavenged on or eaten by a, a predator, like say a raccoon. Let's say a raccoon eats you know, five or six of these um, and then is eaten by a mountain lion. So you can see this accumulation of this toxin. So raccoon has five times as much as was in one mouse and a puma eats three raccoons that have that much and you can see how it can easily skyrocket in the amount of poison that's being ingested by these upper predators. Um, evidence suggests that um, it, bobcats and pumas aren't um, dying because of the poisons directly but their immune systems are very much compromised by them and they're becoming susceptible to diseases, to diseases that they wouldn't normally, so things that they would normally be able to fight off. In fact, this is um, one of the reasons why there's been a huge collapse in the bobcat population in Southern California. They think that it's because um, they have so much rodenticide that um, they've become susceptible to mange, and mange was what was actually killing them. But um, normally that wouldn't have happened in that population. And then of course habitat changes. So this is gonna be much more important in places that are developing such as the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, pumas um, really like intact forests and if we 
build a road or build a housing development or something that cuts off or splits that um, intact forest, um, then either that entire habitat is lost and is no longer going to be used by a puma, or that puma is going to have to go back and forth between these two patches to, to have a sufficient home range um, for hunting. So either way, it's not good for the puma. And why do we care if we lose just one puma? Um, so first of all, if it's a male or even a female, um, when a puma is lost from a home range, there's a reshuffling, a reorganization that happens within the puma population. Pumas, if it's a good home range, other pumas are gonna be fighting each other to get into that home range. And, and pumas will fight each other to the death for a really good home range. So obviously that's not something that is ideal. Um, furthermore, if it's a female, 70% of a female puma's life is spent either being pregnant or caring for young. Um, their young will stay with them for one to two years. That's how long it takes to really educate a young puma on how to hunt um, appropriately. So if you lose a, a female, um, you're either having cubs that are much too young. Um, so like, for example, this little baby down here behind the sheriff's car, that cat's gonna have to live in captivity for the rest of its life. Um, alternatively, if it is old enough to survive, it, it's not completely educated. So these are animals that are gonna end up taking down easier prey until they learn how to take down deer and other wildlife. So these are going to, these are often your animals that are taking captive animals because they're, or domestic animals because they're just easier and the puma hasn't been fully educated to take down its preferred prey, which is mule deer in this area. Uh, and then of course the worst case scenario is that these abandoned cubs are just die. Okay, here's a little side note. I wasn't sure exactly where to put this, but what about, we've been hearing um, or have been having questions about the effects of the SARS-CoV-2 virus on cats. So just like with humans, the research out there is incredibly limited, but it looks like SARS-CoV-2 is almost exclusively human-to-human -human transmission. Viral loads can be high enough to tr be transmitted to a cat, um, so cats can become infected, but it appears that their viral loads are too low to be transmitted back to a human and infect a susceptible human. Um, they might be high enough to infect other cats, um, but it doesn't transmit easily. Um, so that's what we, we call this a spillover host. So it's, it's something that gets infected, but it's a dead end once it gets in there. Um, and then the other question we've been having is whether people should be worried about their cats dying from it. The early evidence suggests that when cats do become infected, they're, um, they don't seem to have symptoms. But again, this is um, very early and the CDC recommends that if you're infected, you should isolate from your pets um, as well as other humans. So definitely follow those guidelines. Okay, refocusing back to the San Francisco um, pumas and their populations in decline. We actually had a small victory a few weeks ago that we're very excited about. Um, the Center for Biological Diversity and Mountain Lion Foundation have been working um, along with a number of other organizations, including our own, um, to try to get pumas to be acknowledged as locally endangered. So we know that the puma population in within the entire country is relatively stable. But locally, we are gonna lose our pumas in the next 50, 100 years in, in a lot of our urban areas um, or peri-urban areas like um, SF and down south. So they've been working towards um, having the California Department of Fish and Wildlife open an investigation um, into having these animals acknowledged as locally endangered, which would give them some special protections. So we're very excited about that. Um, it took a lot of hard work to, to get us here and we're, we're very excited. 
Okay, so hopefully I've made it clear why we work on pumas in the Bay Area, why we're worried about them and their populations. Um, so now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the approach that we are taking at with the Bay Area Puma Project to, to try to conserve these animals. Um, and we do that through th in three different outlets, the primary one being research, um, but also using education and outreach as key tools to, to promote this conservation. So I'm gonna start first with our K through 12 education programs, which we call CATAWARE. It's a three module program, um, which includes a lecture followed by a lab and then um, a field trip. And these are tailored to different age groups. The field trips are super fun. They get to play with uh, wildlife cameras and they get to identify animal tracks and scat and things like that. It's really fun. Um, if that's something that you're interested in having at, one, at your school, once schools reopen, um, contact uh, Kat and I'll have her email at the very end of the presentation and she can give you some more information. So K through 12 education programs. Um, we also do a lot of outreach. So in a different time, we were doing a lot of tabling and lectures to the community. Um, luckily, we have always put a lot of effort into our online resources, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, so we have a lot of resources there as well. And now we're doing this really cool webinar series. Um, and then in addition to that, we are, starting to debut what we're calling our wild backyard community projects. Um, these are projects where the community really comes together and voices their concerns and works together to collect the data that um, they think their community needs to answer questions about conserving wildlife. Um, I'm not gonna go into it too much here uh, because we're actually gonna have a webinar specifically on this topic on May 28th. So if that's something that you're interested in, definitely register for that um, webinar as well. Okay, now getting into our research priorities. So our interest is really in preserving healthy individuals and healthy puma populations. And these are um, only subtly different, but um, by conserving healthy individuals, we're talking about, you know, reducing hunting and reducing the impacts of rodenticides and those types of things that can um, impact specific individuals. And also, while also maintaining a healthy population. So that means um, connectivity between uh, different habitat patches and um, maintaining genetic diversity in that population. Um, on top of that, we're really interested in monitoring where puma activity occurs and, and when it is occurring, um, puma and other wildlife, bobcats and so forth. Um, so knowing where animals are moving at what times and both um, seasonally and, you know, and daily. Um, and we're really interested in exploiting non-invasive techniques to do this work. Um, so now I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about some research projects that we've recently completed and um, then talk a little bit about some projects that we are we have ongoing. So we'll talk about three projects that we've completed in the last year or two. Um, the first one is our Puma, what we, what we call our Puma body condition paper. So we were really interested in the health of pumas in three different habitat types in the San Francisco Bay Area in a natural habitat. So the picture I have up here is Crystal Springs Reservoir on the San, Mateo, or the, um, San Francisco Peninsula. This is really pristine habitat. Um, there's very little human activity here because it's close to the public. Um, so a very nice natural environment. Um, as compared to what, what we're calling like a marginally disturbed area that like golf courses, think about like cemeteries or really large parks, um, national parks and so forth. Um, and that's all being compared to a highly disturbed like suburban area where there is greenery, but there's a lot of people. Um, so what we did is we used our camera data. We pulled out pictures of um, pumas and we gave them body condition scores. So this is a um, 
a technique that's used in wildlife a lot, but not in pumas yet. So we um, got to trial that, which was really cool. But it's very commonly used in lion and African lions and so forth. Um, anyway, this, this is just three pictures to give you an idea. It's a one to nine scale with one being very thin and nine being obese, captive animal, typically. So we have our three down at the bottom, our five in the middle, and our seven, which, and this is actually a picture of the same guy who was in the video earlier doing the rub. Um, so he's, he's our great big number seven over here. Um, and just um, for a little context, anything from like, like a three to a seven is theoretically he healthy, um, but five being kind of this ideal level. So what are our results? Um, they're actually really interesting and not what we expected. So we expected that the natural, that pumas living in these more natural environments would have higher body condition scores. What we found was actually that the body condition was higher in marginally disturbed areas. Um, and this was really interesting and also very exciting because it means that um, pumas can survive and maybe even thrive in these marginally disturbed habitats, which was very exciting. Um, of course, we had to do a little more digging to figure out why, what is it about these marginally disturbed habitats that um, may be contributing to these body condition scores. So we were looking at, uh, so we, we looked at the uh, detection rates, so how many how much activity of other species. And sure enough, um, relative to each other, the marginally disturbed habitats had a lot more prey resources, um, especially deer, which is the puma's main prey in, um, in our region. So that, that worked out nicely. So if you're interested in more detail specifically about this paper, um, it was published last year, so I can send a PDF copy. So just shoot me an email um, and I'm happy to do that. Okay, another project that we've finished recently is um, working on I-280. So I-280 along the San Francisco Peninsula is a notorious roadkill hotspot in, in the entire state of California. Um, these little stars here are pumas that were that we know of that were hit by cars um, just between 2013 and 2017. So there's been um, quite a few just pumas, not, not even to mention all the other wildlife. Um, so we know it's a roadkill hotspot. What can we do? So in other parts of the world, people are starting to look into these um, wildlife crossing, so underpasses or overpasses. So we became kind of interested in, okay, so we know I-280 is a roadkill hotspot. Can, if we were to suggest putting a crossing somewhere, where would it be? Um, so we came at this uh, from two different directions, one detecting wildlife near I-280 and also looking directly at roadkill um, using the UC Davis roadkill database. Um, it was actually quite interesting. There didn't seem to be a universal crossing area. So these animals are really being detected and being hit by cars all along this um, I-280 corridor, um, which suggests that we really do need to have some kind of crossing. Um, but also it'll be important to funnel animals down to that crossing because right now animals are just crossing anywhere along it. Additionally, um, we had some other useful takeaways, mostly um, to give specifically to drivers. So roadkill is a lot more common in October and November along I-280. So these are times when you might wanna be more cautious um, on the I-280 roadway. Um, additionally, almost the majority of the roadkill and the detections um, were occurring closer to urban areas. So the farther north you got on I-280, the more we were seeing wildlife. Um, and that was mostly raccoons. So that's where you just need to be careful the farther north you get, um, and especially during October, November. And so this study was also published. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about that work, 
um, I'm happy to send you a copy of that as well. Okay, our most recently um, completed study was looking at habitat preferences of pumas in the Bay Area. So habitat preference studies have been done for pumas in, uh, on several occasions, but the San Francisco Bay Area is very unique. Um, our habitat patches are very spread out from each other. Um, obviously we have this huge bay in the middle that makes you know, getting across almost impossible. Um, so we were really interested in whether our puma population had different requirements or different preferences about their habitat. Um, did it have to do with uh, prey density? Did it have to do with tree cover? Um, pumas are stock and ambush predators, so they really need tree cover to successfully hunt, um, to, be, to be their stealthy selves, ideal stealthy selves. Um, do they require some level of slope or rugged terrain? Um, and of course, naturalness. We have a lot of people here, like at what threshold um, do we, or is it important that um, humans are away from the pumas? So our results suggest that really the most important predictor of um, puma presence or puma occupancy is what we call it, um, is forest cover. So they're really looking for forested areas. Um, of course, prey had to be present, but prey density was not an important predictor and neither was um, human or human disturbance levels. So that was pretty interesting, but of course uh, led to a number of follow-up questions that we'll talk about. Um, if you're interested in this model that we developed for uh, puma occupancy, it also has information about um, deer occupancy in it as well. Um, feel free to email me and I can show you that PDF as well. Okay, so I'm gonna kinda shift now to our ongoing research, starting with um, a follow-up to that occupancy study that I was just talking about. So if we, look at this um, occupancy map, this ideal habitat map. The thing that really sticks out to me is how disjointed these fragments are um, and how, how different they are from each other. We have ones that are huge connected fragments, like we have um, that huge fragment up at the top that has a bunch of Marin, Sonoma, Napa, and even some Solano County in it versus you know these tiny little fragments around the bay um, like even Angel Island is technically an ideal habitat. Um, of course pumas aren't going to inhabit every single one of these theoretically ideal habitats so that's kind of led to a number of additional questions that we're starting to research right now. Um, the first of which is figuring out which of these habitats is actually, which of these habitat patches are actually being used by pumas. Um, we expect that there's some level of threshold at which pumas no longer use it. So obviously pumas have these very large habitat requirements. So the bigger the habitat patch, it should be the better for the puma, right? Um, but they're not going to occupy teeny tiny little fragments. Um, so where is that threshold? It, this figure here is just a, a hypothesis that, you know, we're going to be much more likely to detect a puma in a large one as compared to a small one. And this isn't just for the patch area, this um, type of threshold analysis we're going to do for isolation. So, for example, Angel Island, technically it's got good habitat, but I don't suspect a whole lot of pumas swimming from Mill Valley to Angel Island. Um, so how far away um, is too far away for a puma to travel? What is it? Is there anything important about what's in between the two patches um, about whether or not a puma will tra traverse it and so forth? So that's the first step of um, this follow-up analysis. The second is that 
we know these patches are going to change um, for a variety of reasons. One, our population is growing and um, we're taking over, um, we're, we're cutting down some of this forested area, encroaching into it. Um, also climate change, right? So climate change is going to change how much of these forests survive, whether they burn down and so forth. Um, so the way that we're going to be modeling that is using information about past growth. So these two pictures, two maps that I have up, um, the, one of them is from 1984 and one is from 2018. And you can see um, over that scale loss of the, some of these green spaces to, to urbanization, um, to agriculture and so forth. So we're going to use that kind of information about how it has changed in the past. Um, and then some information about the current infrastructure. Where do we currently have roads? What are the zoning laws? Is it private? Is it public land? Um, is it, does it have a conservation easement on it and so forth? And then also um, incorporate some climate change projections um, into our modeling so that we can get into phase three, which is what can we do now to conserve, what, what should we conserve now to maintain a healthy Puma population? Okay, and then the other project we have going on right now, um, luckily we had, you know, 100 wildlife cameras out in the Bay Area already before coronavirus and the shelter in place orders um, started coming through. Um, you may have seen in San Francisco, the, some of the coyotes are starting to take back the city um, so we're really interested in, in the parks and the natural places that we work already, um, actually monitoring how, how these, how activity is changing. Um, so we've been working with our colleagues at, at different parks, um, to be able to get in there and still maintain and service these cameras so that we can have a complete data set and really track how these things are changing. Um, and just as a side note, um, Puma sightings in resident, residential areas have not increased at all. So we've seen coyotes coming out, but pumas are still staying away from residential areas. So um, we haven't seen any change in behavior in that way. We're in more interested in these natural areas where we knew they already existed if they're um, coming around more frequently. Okay, so we are starting to wrap up, come to the end of our webinar here. Um, so I just wanna give you a few additional details. So first of all, we have a really great online presence. Um, Bay Area Puma Project has its own website, BAP.org. Um, and then our Feel a Day Fund, which kind of talks about all of our global projects, um, has its own website. We're on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. We post some really cute, cool videos and photos from our um, wildlife trail cameras. Um, also, we have, this is the first in at least six webinars. Um, so you can check out some, maybe some of these other webinars as well. Um, and then a lot of you guys are maybe parents and looking for some educational um, activities for your children. We actually have a mobile app, uh, a mobile game called Puma Wild. It's really cool. You are a puma and you're hunting for deer um, in increasingly urban environments. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing. Our, our websites also have a ton of other educational materials on them. So definitely worth checking out if you are um, homeschooling right now. Okay. Um, if all this um, got you really excited and you really want to start helping out, here are some ways that you can do so. So first of all, we have, you know, a hundred or more wildlife cameras. Those are almost entirely maintained by volunteers. So we're always looking for help in the field to service these cameras. So if you like hiking, um, that's a, a great way to get involved. Um, if you are not nearby or if hiking isn't really available to you, um, each one of these hundred cameras can collect hundreds or thousands of photos a month. Um, and to make that data usable for our analyses, they have to be cataloged and entered into a database. 
Um, so we're always looking for volunteers to help us catalog. That can be done remotely, um, so from your own home. Um, and you might see a super cute bobcat checking you out or some raccoons or something checking out the camera, which is pretty fun. Um, of course, making a donation is also an incredibly helpful thing, especially right now. Um, a lot of the funding sources are um, being pushed off right now. Um, Giving Tuesday, it, Giving Tuesday now is actually taking place next week or less than a week away now. Um, so we have a GoFundMe page for the, our Giving Tuesday now. Um, so feel if you're feeling generous, that's the place to go. Um, lastly, if you see a puma um, or a bobcat, uh, please add it to our sightings map. So our um, Bay Area Puma Project website, BAP.org, has a, uh, we collect sightings there, especially if you have a picture, it's really great. Um, we're gonna be using this, especially for our um, habitat patch analysis that I was talking about to um, determine which habitat patches are actually being used. So this is very useful data for us right now. So if you see something come across your next door, please add it to our sightings map. Um, and if you're interested in volunteering, reach out to um, Kat. She's, uh, her email is here down at the bottom on the left. Okay, and then of course I wanna say thank you so much to our volunteers, our interns, our citizen scientists, and our funders and supporters um, that make this work possible. And at the scale, that it's at right now. And then I have to leave you with a cute cat video, of course. Here's a mama and three little um, squiggly babies here from Crystal Springs Reservoir. Ugh, I just love that video. It's so cute. Okay, and with that, um, I am happy to take some questions. Um, Zara is going to be joining us. And um, so if you have your questions, Type them into your chat box and we will try to answer them. Actually, Q&A. So um, I've answered a bunch of the questions okay. and I, I can't, you know, I want to jump one at you right away, Courtney, so we can get through them because we don't have a lot of time. Okay. Can you, can you see the Q&A there where you are? Oh, uh, no. Okay. Oh, wait. Let me see. Otherwise, I'll just read it out so that people know. Okay. Um, or most people can read these because these are accessible to everybody, but um, they're asking, Marina is asking about mercury poisoning in these animals in the local Bay Area population. So how does this endanger this local population of pumas? And why don't you take that and I'm going to answer a couple more on the chat. So I don't know that um, any of that sort of research has been done. Um, so most of the um, toxin research has been done down in Southern California. Um, so we don't, we really don't know about the, the puma population up here and how they're being exposed to rodenticides, to mercury poisoning. Um, we suspect that, you know, illegal grow operations, they put out a lot of rodenticides to keep their crops safe. Um, and how much of that is also running through our puma and, and bobcat population as well. We just don't know at this time. Okay, the next question is from Chloe. Chloe Reed, does the temporary endangered status change how Felidae can interact with the local pumas? Or because of the camera traps, non-invasive techniques are used there will essentially be no change in field work. Um, we can just sort of answer that directly. I don't, I don't foresee anything changing with our field work, but we will see a change in potentially response because it's up until now been relatively easy to uh, get a depredation permit when needed. So if you want to say something else on that, Courtney, I'm still typing in some responses here as well. Yeah. Um... I, I don't foresee us changing our techniques. Um, we may end up working to collect some additional data that's necessary to get that special status. But um, I mean, the techniques that we'll use will probably be the same, remain the same. Um, but yeah, like as Zara was saying, 
we do suspect um, or hope that if this status is given that um, we can protect pumas from these depredation permits and um, make it a little more serious um, the threat that they're make it more obvious what threat they're under Couple people here are interested in uh, whether pumas get affected by the prions and wasting disease because they aren't feeding on brain material. Um, I'm gonna let you take that too. I'm still trying to catch us up in the chat. Um, the research suggests that the pumas and um, most of the other predators are not being infected by chronic wasting disease. Um, so yeah, they're, they're not eating the brains um, or the, a lot of the nervous tissue, so they don't seem to be susceptible to, to chronic wasting disease. They are susceptible to a number of other um, diseases like rabies, uh, toxoplasmosis, um, and I think that's all I can, and a plague, and plague bacteria as well. So there's, there's other things that they can get from their prey, but um, chronic wasting disease does, is, hasn't been detected yet. Why more roadkill in October and November, shortage of prey? That's from Christina. So we, we don't know for sure. So those were, results were for a number of different species. Um, different species have different ecological rhythms, I'm sure you're aware, but um, that time is often a time when mating occurs for some species, um, dispersal is occurring for some species, so they're moving away from, if they were spring babies, they're moving away from mom, um, and then mom is sometimes getting, looking to get pregnant again for um, birth in the spring, so um, that tends to line up. All right, um, let's see here. Where are we on this list? A few questions to go. What is the rank order of risks for survival of the Bay Area Pumas? Uh, we often talk about these in our talks, um, but why don't you just run through those, Courtney, as we, as we usually list those, starting at the top with our favorite depredation permits till, till now. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully not going forward. Yeah, so, um, I, yeah, depredation permits would be near the top. Um, obviously poaching, we have no idea what that number looks like in reality because those aren't being reported, um, but we suspect quite a few. Um, and then probably, um, um, so loss of habitat is also one of these kind of enigmatic threats that's impossible to put your finger on how many animals are being affected by that. Um, but it's a lot. So for example, we had our, um, had a puma wander into San Francisco a year and a half ago or so. There's just not enough room for these pumas to go and nowhere for them to go. Um, so that's definitely something that we're seeing. Um, being hit by cars um, is very localized. So I-280 um, is a real big one along I-5 corridor as well. Um, so it's, it's hard to rank them because a lot of them don't have strongly reported numbers. So roadkill in particular, um, very few people will report it. There's no, Caltrans does not keep a running tab of that information. Um, and even f we've had people report to us um, a hit by car Puma and by the time we get out there, it's gone. So whether somebody picks it up to have the skull or whatever. Um, so a lot of these things, they just don't have reliable numbers to, to even rank them in a way that we would like to. Hey, Courtney, can you show the contacts page again, the ways they can reach us and um, I think this person, Richard, is asking about uh, looking at that page again so they can take down that information. Sure, let me see what I can do. And while, while you are doing that, I will... So here's Kat's um, information down at the bottom. So you can, you can email her um, with, with questions. 
My contact information is Courtney Kuhn at feelitafund.org. So I'll spell that out. It's C-O-U-R-T-N-E-Y-C-O-O-N at feelitafund.org, same as um, cats. So let's get through the last few questions and, and they can always reach us at info at, so that's um, not an issue, but an anonymous uh, person is asking, I'm passionate about pumas and I want to do things with them in college. What would be the best college for doing things related to pumas? Wow, there's a number of great colleges for this. Um, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, so there's a, a number of places doing some research projects. My suggestion would be to go on to Google Scholar and type in Puma research and filter by a few recent years, so 2018, 2019, 2020, and find some papers that you're really interested in that really get you excited, um, and then look at the author list and figure out where that research is being done. So um, UC San Cruz is a great spot. Um, there's a number of colleges that collaborate for the um, Southern California project. Uh, Utah State University is a great place. Um, obviously, most of the research on pumas is being done out west because East Coast doesn't have any pumas. Um, so that's, that's, I think, all I have on that. If you want more information, I'm happy to, you can send me an email and I can um, direct you a little bit further. All right, so next question. Why puma's health condition is less well in the natural habitats, why the prey number is less in the natural habitats. And that's directly asking about our body condition paper. Right, so it's actually really interesting. So my, um, my guess is that in marginally disturbed habitats, there's more food, more consistent food resources available towards these urban adapted species. So specifically thinking of raccoons, deer, foxes, squirrels. So these animals tend to like um, either human garbage, in the case of raccoons, or um, human ornamental plants, like deer. So we water our plants year round, so that vegetation is consistent. We have a lot of deer in these on a, let's think of a golf course, right? So we think that that's why there's just more prey, avail prey availability in those areas. Okay, um, we are at six. We're gonna just take one more question and then we're gonna let everyone go. If you did not have your question answered, please reach out to us. Um, we did have a Zoom lock out a, another hundred people who are trying to get into this web webinar. So you're lucky to get in. For some reason, Zoom's kind of having issues these days. I wonder why. <laughs> um, so one last question I'm gonna send you and then I'm gonna tell everyone that we will reach out to you with answers if you're interested, um, but you will also get a recording of this video as well um, in the cloud. So does, uh, does Florida count as East Coast? Mm. Whom is there? Though they are probably not as closely related. So there's a long story to yes. that, Susan. And um, you want to give the 15 second version, Courtney? Ooh. Well, so yes, I guess pumas do technically count as an East Coast population because they are on the East Coast. Um, they were not a viable population. They had to have an, an influx of genetic diversity from Texas puma population. So um, they're not the subspecies that they used to be, but they are um, a slightly different subspecies than what we have here on the West Coast. Okay, so we got questions about the app, so I can help you there, Steve. And have we observed any similar symptoms in California pumas as the ones observed in Florida panthers and bobcats? Not yet, thank God. Well, not quite that bad. Yeah. Go ahead, so I'm, I'm still trying to okay. type in this. Um, so yeah, so I, there are, um, I think they're starting to see some kinked tails and things um, down south, but not any of the really weird genetic things that they were starting to see in Florida. 
Um, so, but there has been research done um, about genetic diversity um, and that's uh, being run by Holly Ernst. Um, and she's shown where, where the pitfalls are in the state. So Northern California, the genetic diversity is, is pretty good. Um, but when you hit the Bay Area and Southern California, it's trash. So, and I can send you those papers as well if, um, if you're interested in, in just seeing them kind of mapped out where that genetic diversity is high and where it's really low. Okay, the very last question we're going to take because it's an interesting one um, from Christina. Do they have records of cougars feeding on trash? I don't know of any, but depends on what trash you are talking about. Yeah, so there are a few reports of pumas scavenging off of roadkill, um, but cat, but wild cats are what they call obligate carnivores. They have to eat meat. Um, so they're not going to be eating a sandwich that they found in a trash can. Um, but whether they would eat like some deli meat, I don't know. I don't think there's been any research on that. Great. So we're going to let everyone go. We're a little bit after the hour and I want to thank everyone again for attending. Join us next week if you'd like to hear about the Savo cheetahs and uh, let us know your thoughts on the webinar as well when you get our survey. And thanks so much for your patience. This is our first webinar, so it went okay considering. So we're happy to have everyone join us and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks everybody. Thanks so much.